This lesson is all about airports. As a pilot, you will need to know how to get around on the ground and in the air at airports with and without control towers. This lesson looks at operating an aircraft safely on the ground and in flight and focuses on airport, runway, and taxiway signs and what they mean. We will also look at how to fly into and out of an airport. In this lesson, we'll look at the different types of airports, where you can get information about airports, signs and markings on airports, airport lighting, wind indicators, the airport traffic pattern, land and hold short operations, and hand signals. This is a longer lesson and has several animations to help you put airport markings and traffic patterns to use. There are basically two types of airports, those with control towers and those without control towers. An airport with an operating control tower has FAA air traffic controllers who aid and direct the flow of traffic. You will be required to communicate with ATC via a communications radio. Control towers provide clearances for takeoff, landing, and transitioning aircraft. They can also provide taxi instructions and clearances and sometimes radar services. For now, you just need to know that at control tower at airports, you'll be required to communicate with them and follow the instructions you get. Uncontrolled airports are airports that are available for you to use but do not have a control tower. These airports don't require you to communicate with anyone or get any clearances. There are set procedures for going to uncontrolled airports and those will be covered in the traffic pattern section later on in this lesson. Uncontrolled airports don't even require you to have a radio to use the airport. Most of the airports in the USA are uncontrolled airports. There are several places you can get information about the airport you are at or at an airport you want to go. Aeronautical charts, which will be covered in more detail in a later lesson, is the first place most people look. The aeronautical chart shows the physical location of the airport and surrounding towns, roads, and so on. Additionally, there's information about available radio frequencies to use, the airport's elevation, and other information. Another source of information is the Airport and Facilities Directory, or AFD. In this book, you'll find information in more detail about the airport. In many cases, you will also find an airport diagram with the locations of taxiways, runways, buildings, and other information. There will be more information on the AFD when we look at cross-country flight planning. Lastly, we can look at NOTAMs. Putting these sources of airport data together gives pilots some of the necessary tools for successful pre-flight planning. We can categorize airport markings and signs into three broad categories. Runway markings, taxiway markings, and other markings. We'll take a look at each of these categories in detail as this lesson continues. On the right side of the image, you can see an airport. There are a lot of signs at this airport. Don't worry if you can't make out what the signs are now. We're going to look at all of them in the next few minutes. We can categorize airport signs in the six different parts. Signs indicating mandatory compliance, location signs, direction signs, destination signs, information signs, and runway distance left signs. Let's look at each of them and some examples. Mandatory signs are red with white letters. Here are several examples. The top sign shows that you are at runway 26 and 8. The second sign shows you are on the approach end of runway 8. You need to hold short of aircraft on approach to the runway. The third sign indicates that you are at an ILS critical area hold position. You must hold short of the ILS approach critical area when this is active. The last sign indicates that you cannot enter the area. This is placed where the area is paved but an aircraft may not enter. Location signs are black with yellow letters. These are the you are here signs. This top sign shows that you are located on Taxiway Bravo. The second sign shows that you are on runway 22. Airport direction signs are yellow with black letters and often include arrows to point out the way to a taxiway or destination. In this image, the top sign shows that Taxiway Juliet is to the right. 
The next sign shows Taxiway Lima is to the left and would be used where there is a taxiway exiting a runway. The next sign shows that runway 22 is straight ahead. The last sign is a combination sign that shows that Taxiway Alpha is to the left, you are on Taxiway Golf, and Taxiway Lima is to the right. Airport destination signs look like the one in this slide. This particular sign says that MIL is to the left. This is usually a military area on the airport. These signs are often abbreviated and there are no standard abbreviations. These signs are installed either on the left or right of the taxiway depending on where the facility is. Runway remaining signs would be installed on the left side of the runway to indicate to you how much runway in thousands of feet is left. In this example, there are 4,000 feet remaining. Not all airports have these signs. They're usually at airports with longer runways and operations that allow aircraft to depart the runway from different locations. For example, a 747 might need all of the runway to take off and would go to the beginning of the runway. We may decide we need far less than that, so we can ask to depart at a point other than the end. As we pull out onto the runway, we would see this sign. It helps us by allowing us to double check that we really don't need any more runway than we have in front of us. Airport information signs are usually yellow with black letters. They have instructions or recommendations like how to depart the airport to reduce noise, frequencies to use, and anything else that is standard that would need to be communicated to the pilot. These signs are usually located near the beginning of the runway. On this animation, we can see several airplanes parked on the ramp or tie-down area of the airport. We can see a taxiway going straight up to the runway and some pavement markings. On the next part of this animation, we can see an airplane that is holding short of the runway. Notice the lines on the pavement just in front of the airplane. There are two solid lines facing the airplane and two dash lines on the other side. These are called the hold short lines. If the lines are solid on the side we are on, we need to have ATC permission before any part of our airplane crosses these markings. If there are dash lines on our side, then we can cross them without ATC clearance. You'll need to watch for crossing traffic, especially at uncontrolled airports. In this sequence, we see an airplane on a taxiway. The red sign on the right says, Approach. This sign is red with white letters, so it's a mandatory compliance sign. Again, there are yellow hold short lines painted on the pavement, which indicate to us we can't cross them without ATC clearance. In this sequence, there is a mandatory compliance sign called ILS. There is also a new pavement marking near the sign. This is an ILS critical area sign. It means we must hold before this line when the instrument landing system is being used and certain weather conditions exist. This avoids our airplane interfering with the system during bad weather. Here you can see the ramp area again and you can see what looks like pathways for cars. These white pavement markings are for ground vehicles to direct them to various buildings or around certain busy areas. For us it's just important to be on the lookout for vehicles when we see these markings. The symbol that just appeared as a yellow arrow in a circle is the location of what is called a VOT. This is a place where pilots can position their aircraft and do some tests of their radio equipment. It is used mostly by instrument pilots. You can read about VOTs in the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Here is an example of a location and direction sign. The B with the arrow to the left means that taxiway B or Bravo is to the left and the C going off to the bottom right means taxiway Charlie is to the right, as shown by the arrow. The black sign with a yellow letter is a location sign and states that we are on taxiway Alpha. Here we can see the vehicle pavement markings and we see a Do Not Enter sign. Do Not Enter signs apply to both vehicles and to aircraft. Here we can see there are two runways that are both runway 36. One is the left runway and the other is the right runway. Airports having parallel runways use this notation to let you know which one is which.
In this sequence, we see the runway numbers, and we can see some white long lines. These lines indicate the width of the runway. You can tell the width of the runway by the number of these stripes. You'll see more of these in the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Not all runways will have these white stripes. In this sequence, we can now see some big yellow chevrons. This indicates that this part of the runway is not suitable for takeoff or landing. It is used for emergency overruns and may not be structurally as strong as the runway. Just to the left of the runway numbers, you see two fat white lines. These are touchdown bars used by instrument pilots. They allow a pilot to know how much runway has been used at that point and an ideal touchdown area. This sequence shows several things. First, we see two runway remaining signs, one for 6,000 feet and one for 5,000 feet. In the last sequence, we can see a big yellow X on the runway. This means that the runway is closed. Now let's spend a few minutes talking about airport lighting. We'll look at airport beacons first. Most, but not all airports, will have beacons that are switched on at night or during bad weather. Airport beacons help us find the airport at night or in low visibility conditions. Civilian beacons will flash green, then white, alternating again and again. Military airport beacons will flash green, then two quick white flashes. Military airfields are only for emergency use or may be used if you have permission to land there. In your reading, you will see other types of airport beacons. Approach lighting systems will sometimes be installed at airports with instrument landing systems or other instrument approaches to that runway. Even when not used for an instrument approach, the lighting system can help the pilot line up with the runway and help the pilot orient themselves with the runway better at night or in poor visibility. There are sometimes visual glide slope indicators at airports, commonly abbreviated to VGSI. They are installed on the side of the runway and give you vertical guidance to the touchdown zone. In this example, the PAPI, or Precision Approach Path Indicator, is shown first. Here you can see a four-bar system. The four color bars are located to the left of the runway near the two five numbers. In the first example, the airplane is too high, which is indicated to the pilot by four white bars. The next example shows a slightly high indication. This is one red bar and three white bars. An on glide path indication is shown by two red bars and two white bars. A slightly low glide path is shown by three red bars and one white bar and too low is shown by all red bars. There is also a two-bar VASI, and it is probably the most widely used system. Below glide path is shown by two red bars. If the airplane is on glide path, it will be red over white, and if the airplane is too low, it will be red over red. Tricolor VASIs are used at some airports, however, it is not very common. The tricolor VASI has three different colors that indicate the relationship of the glide path to the airplane. The pilot will see only one color at a time. For example, if the airplane is above glide path, the pilot will see a yellow light. If it's on glide path, the pilot will see green. If the airplane starts getting low, it will change to amber. And finally, if the glide path is too low, it will be red. On the runway itself, we sometimes see real lights installed. Real stands for runway end identifier lights. They're usually only installed at airports where the runway is hard to see due to other ground lights around the airport. On the ground, they look like a box with a light in it, as shown in this image. Runways also have steady white lights placed at regular intervals along both sides from the beginning to the end. These are known as runway edge lights. Taxiway lights are blue and border the taxiways. Obstruction lighting is red. You'll see more examples in your reading after this lesson is finished. Some airports will have runway lights on from sunset to sunrise. Other airports may require the pilot to turn them on from the aircraft. This will be indicated to you either on the aeronautical chart or in the AFD. Airports with pilot-controlled lighting are very common in the United States. 
The basic procedure to turn on the lights is to use the communications radio and click the microphone a particular number of times. For example, if you click the microphone button quickly seven times in a row, the lights will come on at their highest intensity. If you click the microphone button five times quickly, the airport lights will come on in medium intensity. If you only click three times, then the airport lighting should come on at low intensity. Some airports only have medium intensity lighting systems installed, so you may not notice a change if you activate the lights at high intensity and later decide to turn the lights down to medium intensity. Pilot activated airport lighting systems are usually on a timer set to turn the lights off after about 15 minutes. Somewhere on the airport you'll find some kind of wind indicator. There are three in widespread use that we will talk about. They are the wind sock, the tetrahedron, and the wind T. The wind sock is the most common wind indicator as it is the only indicator that shows both wind direction and strength. The pointed end of the tetrahedron points in the direction of the landing runway as it automatically turns into the wind. The wind T points into the wind with a crossbar. It also points in the direction of the landing runway. The wind sock lets you see which runway is in use by looking at where the small end is. The runway numbers closest to the small end of the wind sock tells us the landing runway. You'll see these in action in an animation later in this lesson. Now that we know about airport signs and getting around on the ground, we need to look at how to depart and how to come into an airport. There are established procedures to depart and enter what is called the traffic pattern at the airport. The traffic pattern is a path around an airport that involves either right or left turns. In this image, we can see the legs of the traffic pattern. Departing the runway after takeoff, but before making any turns, is known as the upwind leg. Then, following the path to the left, we are now on the crosswind leg. After another left turn, we are on the downwind leg. The next leg of the pattern is a left turn to the base leg. Finally, we make the last left turn to final. We will use these definitions throughout the rest of this presentation. The traffic pattern can either be left or right turns depending on the established procedure at each airport. There is a side of the airport that is probably more favorable than the other side due to things like high terrain, houses, or other obstructions or sensitive areas. The FAA sets out whether it's left traffic, also known as left turns, or right traffic, also known as right turns. To decode which it is, we need a little more information. On this image, you'll see something called the segmented circle. The segmented circle will have two components. First, it will have a wind indicator, like we saw a little while ago. This wind indicator will be located in the middle of the segmented circle and will be either a wind sock, wind tee, or tetrahedron. The other part of the segmented circle will be the direction of turn indicators. These are the little L's just outside of the circle. Look at the segmented circle in the image and look at the direction of turn indicators. The shortest path of the L is the base leg in the traffic pattern and the long part is the final approach. If you look at the L on the left side of the segmented circle in the middle, you could conclude that left traffic is indicated for the approach. The short piece makes a left turn from the base leg to the final approach. Segmented circles are made to be of size so they are visible from altitudes of up to about 2,000 feet above the airport. If there is no segmented circle, the default traffic pattern direction is left turns. You'll see an animation later that will help you visualize this better. So what about coming into an airport? The pattern entry options depend on whether the airport is controlled or uncontrolled. If it is controlled, the tower controller will give you an instruction about how they want you to enter the traffic pattern. The typical pattern entries to controlled airports are enter on the downwind, enter on the base, or make a straight-in approach. This means that you fly the airplane so as to put the airplane on one of these legs. If you're entering the pattern at an uncontrolled airport, there is procedure to follow because there is no one who can issue you an instruction. Your choices are listed in the Aeronautical Information Manual. 
To summarize, you can make a 45 degree entry, which is shown on this image. This means that you position the airplane so as to join the pattern on a 45 degree angle to the midpoint of the downwind leg. This is like a merge lane. You can also enter on the downwind or crosswind and follow the rest of the pattern. The key point here is that you should choose an entry that will allow you to see everyone in the traffic pattern visually before you make any turns. A straight-in approach is not recommended as it's hard to see any other traffic. In this animation you can see that both airplanes are making left turns. After taking off, the airplane flies upwind, then turns left to crosswind, then left to downwind, and left to base leg, and then to final approach. Now we can see aircraft in right traffic. The airplanes are making right turns and the legs are the same as in left traffic. In this part of the animation, we see the segmented circle without the wind indicator. For now, we can just look at the airplanes. The airplane using runway 27 is making left traffic. Notice on the segmented circle, the L in line with runway 27 shows left turns. L doesn't mean left, it's the short part of the L that says which way to turn. The airplane using runway 31 is making right turns, and if you look at the L in line with runway 31, you can see that the little part of the L turns right onto final approach. To make sure you are clear on the legs of the traffic pattern, this shows everything all at once. Now you can see how to enter the traffic pattern using the 45 degree entry. In this example, we are making left traffic for runway 27. Notice that the 45 degree entry is at the midpoint of the downwind leg. So that's a way to enter the pattern, but what about leaving it? Here we have several choices. All of our choices must be either straight out or the turn must be in the same direction as that established for the pattern. That means that if left traffic is in use, like in our example, then you must either fly straight out or make your departure to the left. We'll take a few moments here to now talk about pattern altitude. Every airport has an altitude above it that we should fly the pattern at. This is called TPA, or traffic pattern altitude. It is usually 1,000 feet above the airport's surface, but not always. The pattern altitude can be found in the AFD, or Airport Facilities Directory. So, if this airport were at sea level, then the traffic pattern would be at 1,000 feet. Our turns would be made from between 700 and 1,000 feet. In the animation, you can see three examples of departures. The first is a straight out departure. The second is a left 45 degree departure. And the third is a downwind departure. Here is a representation of the airport with the segmented circle and we've included wind. Remember, we always want to take off into wind unless there is no other choice. So we need to know what the runway into the wind is and also the direction of turns. In the example here we have a wind sock showing the small end pointing to runway 27. The segmented circle shows runway 27 to have left traffic. So, we will use runway 27 with left turns. So what if the wind is shifting or variable? Well, then the runway is entirely up to you. This shows what the wind sock would do in varying winds. So here is a runway with no segmented circle, but we have two other aircraft in the pattern. One is entering the 45 and the other is following left turns for runway 27. 
It's important to see that these pilots allowed enough spacing to allow each other to take off and to land without getting in each other's way. At some controlled airports, there can be a procedure called LASSO in effect. LASSO is short for Land and Hold Short Operations. In your reading, you will see this in more detail. To introduce it to you, we will need to start by saying that at very busy airports that have intersecting runways, there may be LASSO operations in effect. ATC will tell you if this is the case. When you are cleared to land, you will be given a point on the runway that you have to stop by. This means you can't use all of the runway. You must land and be able to hold short of some point before the end of the runway is directed by ATC. Pilots are not required to accept LASSO clearances, and refusing a LASSO clearance is entirely reasonable. The last thing we need to spend a moment on is hand signals. These are standard marshalling signals normally used by ground crew to communicate to you what they want you to do with your aircraft. These signals usually regard entering a ramp area to park and leaving a ramp area. You will need to be familiar with the more common signals so that you will be able to park at airports with such personnel. The AIM or Aeronautical Information Manual has a complete list and you should look these over at the end of this lesson. In your cross-country flight training, you will go to other airports and will most likely be exposed to hand signals. This is the end of this lesson.